Anyway, that goes on, right? So you got to keep talking about these things. Come, friends, and gather round. You, broken, beloved, and beautiful. You, sinner, and sinned against. You, child of God. Come as you are, for this is your place. Come open your ears and hear the story of our God, a story of compassion and mercy, a story of redemption and love, a story passed down through the ages that we might remember who we are and whose we are. Come and listen, for this is your story. Come and see what God has done. Come and see what God is doing. Come and see God's love in action. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. You may remain seated or kneel as you are comfortable. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way of new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. 
journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able. Let us join our hearts and voices in our gathering song, Waymaker. Good morning, St. Martin's. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Whether you are joining us in person or joining us from online, whether you have been here many times or this is your first time, you are welcome here and it is good to be with you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We have a few announcements as we get started today. And first, 
I just want to share a word of thanks to the crew that came out yesterday to do some painting on the outside wall. Uh, a little bit of uh, sprucing up before Oktoberfest. Uh, multiple people, uh, Monica and Leon, Chris, uh, Nate St uh, uh, Hopkins, who is not here this morning, Shannon Giller, uh, a whole bunch of people came out, Jerry, Gene Short. Uh, we are grateful for all of you, for your time, for your effort. Uh, thank you for the work that you did to make this place beautiful. Uh, Fina Heffel has an announcement for us, an event that your uh, Girl Scout troop is doing. Is it Pause for Pets? Yes. Come on up and share with us a little bit. Thank you, Fina. Good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning. My Girl Scout troop has created a program called Pause for Pets, and our goal is to make sure that almost every animal in our neighborhood or anywhere is microchipped. Microchipping is where you insert a micro, like a chip, into the animal's skin so that if they get lost and someone finds them, the vets are able to know all your information and give your pet back to you. And it can get really expensive from 40 to like $60 per microchip to your animal. We are hosting an event on Saturday, October 22nd it, for $15 for microchipping. So almost like half off and or over half off. And at this event, you can donate or you don't have to, you can just get your micro, your pet microchipped, only for $15 again. It'll be at the New Territory Club um, at Sugarland from 9 a.m. to 11 to 1 p.m. And thank you. Thank you, Fina. <laughs> Fina has flyers with her, so if you are interested, if you'd like to know more, please talk to Fina after worship. Thank you for the work you're doing. Oktoberfest is coming up Saturday, the 29th. Kelsey has some information for us about Oktoberfest and I understand about Costumes for Christ the next yes. day. Yes. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kelsey Vickery and I am the Youth and Family Director here at St. Martin's. And there are a lot of fun events coming up, specifically all in one very jam-packed, exciting weekend. Um, so this is our Oktoberfest flyer. If you didn't get it in the mail, Miss Barb has one for you in the back that you can take with you. I also encourage you to take one with you and to give it to your friends, to give it to your neighbors, to give it to someone in the grocery line that you see. Because the more people that come and get to see how wonderful St. Martin's are, the more we grow. And the more we grow, the more our community gets to be an active, live, exciting community. And we've seen that happening over the last year. And this is another opportunity to do that. Some fun things that are already starting that you should know about is if you make your way down the hall in the library window, you'll see the beautiful quilt that is being raffled off. And the tickets are already available. So if you want to get in now, so you're like one of the first lucky ticket holders, now is your chance to do that. Also on the tables in the North X are signups. We need some people to help with our pastor's pantry, which is our baked goods thing, event. Um, we need all kinds of baked goods. If you can bake something and wonderful, if you can go to Kroger and get cookies, wonderful. Like we need lots and lots and lots of baked goods so that our pastor's pantry is really full. Um, and then we also need help with setup and tear down. We have 25 vendors that are going to be here selling their goods, everything from candles to doll clothes to clothing for kids and everything in between. And we need some help preparing for them on Friday night. And if you're able, we would love that. And then on Saturday after the event, we need to make this building ready for Sunday morning so that we can all gather and worship. So if you're able to help with either of those, that sign up is also out there. Then on Sunday, we're going to have our now annual Costumes with Christ. And what that is, is everyone from our youngest friends to our youngest at heart friends, we encourage you to wear your church appropriate Halloween costumes to church. And we'll get all dressed up and we'll have a little competition. And then we're going to follow that with trunk or treat. Um, I already know some people are going to compete with Mr. Moore over here. So if you're interested in, in competing with him and having a wonderful trunk, please come see me. The candy will be provided. 
You just have to be creative and come up with something fun. And we'll have a competition to see who takes home the big trophy for the coolest um, trunk. So that is all of that information. Oh, did I forget something, Monica? I did want to say we will have a table donated to us uh, by one of our hospitals. We will be distributing free flu shots. I knew I was forgetting something. And that's really important this season. Sometimes we miss it from our companies that offer shots, or we forget to go to Kroger's, but we will have uh, nurses and doctors here doing that, and that will be free for anyone who comes. So lots of things happening. So you, if you have questions, you can find me, you can find Pastor, you can find the Parish Life Committee, you can find Monica. We all have lots of answers. So we hope to see you both at Oktoberfest and uh, the next day at Costumes of Christ. That's all I got. That's a lot. There's a lot happening here, folks, and we're great to support. It's a wonderful, exciting time in the life of the congregation. Now I invite you to rise as you're able. Let us continue our worship together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
question for you, a little bit of a game to play with you today. All right. All right, I need a volunteer. I knew you'd volunteer, Ryan. I'm gonna go with someone else this morning because you get to volunteer at home too. Come on up. All right. What's your name, volunteer? Kylie. All right. Kylie, we're gonna play a game. You ever choose a hand? You ever done that game before? Okay, so here's the thing. You have a choice. In one hand, I have a Luther Rose temporary tattoo. In the other hand, I have a sticky note that says, I owe Pastor Will $20. <laughs> you have $20? That's good news because I collect. All right, are you ready? Excellent, then you've got more than enough to make up for this IOU. All right, are you ready? Which hand do you want? This one? Are you sure? Are you positive? Why that one? Because it, it shows the cross of Jesus. It does. It shows the cross of Jesus. That is a, a great choice because you also don't owe me $20. Kylie, thank you so much. I have another choice for you, friends. Come on up. What's your name, sister? Sarah Ann. Sarah Ann? Cheyenne. Cheyenne, excuse me. Okay, Cheyenne, I've got a question for you this time. Do you want an I owe Pastor Will $20 or nothing? You do? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to trade with you and give you a temporary tattoo as well. That was an unexpected choice. Thank you, Cheyenne. <laughs> Ryan, come on up. One more. Do you want an I owe Pastor Will $20 or nothing? I need to rethink my children's sermons, folks. Here you go, I'll collect from you when we get home. <laughs> Why would you choose having to give me something instead of getting something? That's a silly choice, isn't it? Yeah, and it's kind of a silly choice to choose to have to pay me money. Yeah. I want it because you're thinking of other people. You're thinking of other people. I like that answer. That's a great thing to be doing. And Pastor Will's always ready for $20 if anyone else wants an IOU. I've got more. You have a question? Go ahead. Why are the candles lit? Why are the candles lit? That's a great question. We can definitely talk about that. The short answer is because the candles help us remember that Jesus is the light of the world. And they remind us that God is here. Thank you for that question, Cheyenne. Today, today, we'll have time for more questions later. I'm excited that you have questions, though. Today, we're hearing a story in church about a man named Joshua. And Joshua told all the people, that's your dad's name? Very cool. Joshua told all of the people about all the things that God had done for them. And then Joshua gave them a choice. He said, you can choose to serve this God who loves you, who cares about you, who's always with you, or you can choose to serve other gods who don't really do anything for you, who aren't really there for you, who don't love you. Which would you choose? The good one. The good one. Yeah. We all think we'd choose the good one, right? Yeah. That's a smart choice. We want to be good. We want to be good. We don't want to choose the bad one. That's the story that we're hearing today. Joshua puts that question to his people and says, do you want the good God or the not so good stuff of the world? Hey, why is that statue right there? We'll talk about that statue later. <laughs> right now we're talking about choosing Jesus. I love the questions, this is great. So we're gonna hear about how the people said they were gonna choose God Sometimes we don't do such a good job. We're going to ask God to help us make good choices, right? Let's pray together. Dear God, Dear God thank you for today. Thank you for today. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for choosing us. Help us to choose you. Help us to choose you. And to make good choices. And to make good choices. In how we show your love to the world. And how we show your love to the world. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
A reading from the 24th chapter of Joshua, beginning with the first verse. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst, and afterwards I brought you out. Then I brought your ancestors out of, Je out of Egypt. You came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterwards, you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Ammonite, Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you and I handed them over to you and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against the Israelites. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Baor, to curse you, but I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he blessed you, so I rescued you out of his hand. When you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gershahites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by the sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruits of vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served before the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Beloved, let us together read our gospel reflection from Matthew chapter 4. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Grace and peace be to you from God our Creator and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, about a year after Ryan was born, I took a parenting class called Conscious Discipline. The basic idea is that rather than learning how to make our kids do the right thing, anyone ever try that? How'd it work for you? Rather than trying to make our children do the right thing, we could learn how to equip our children with the skills to choose the right thing for themselves. 
And so discipline then is not something we do as a corrective, but something we instill as a guide, a process or a formation, or as we like to call it in church, disciple. One of the first things we talked about was how if we want to teach our children, or anyone else for that matter, to have discipline, we need to first be disciplined. Which is a pretty common sense premise, isn't it? We all know that the most impactful leaders lead by example. We all know how effective the old do as I say, not as I do, can it works. And yet, as much as we can understand the straightforward logic of needing to have discipline before we teach discipline, the truth is it is a lot easier said than done. Our instructor, Miss Beth, talked about choosing the banana. See, sometimes you get a sweet tooth, right? You know there are bananas on the counter that will turn brown and rot in about 10 minutes. <clears throat> and you know there's ice cream in the freezer. Having discipline is knowing that the banana is the healthier option and choosing the healthier option, even though the ice cream might be more fun. If we would teach our children to make the healthy choice, first we have to be prepared to choose the banana for ourselves. And in theory, that's an easy choice. The banana is both sweet and nutritious while the ice cream is just sweet. But you know, if you're like me, you reach for the ice cream more often than the banana. Because as we said last week, there's a difference between knowing what to do and actually doing it. Discipline is hard work. Fortunately, we get a lot of opportunities to practice. We make tons of choices every day. In fact, some researchers suggest that we make as many as 35,000 choices a day, which would equate to about one choice every two seconds. Many of those made subconsciously. But even when they're not choices we are consciously making, they have an impact. Decision fatigue is a phenomenon that describes the impact of making multiple choices and how the quality of our decisions tends to diminish the more decisions we make. It's why grocery stores have all the fun stuff right by the registers. And you know what we call those? Impulse purchases. Because after all the choices we've made, we're more likely to grab that candy bar at the end of the trip than we would have earlier. And it's not just the number of choices we have that can make things overwhelming. Sometimes it's the number of options that we have to choose from all at once. How do you choose where to eat when there are seemingly limitless options within a five mile radius? How do you pick the right bath soap or breakfast cereal when there are six shelves lined with options and half of them are the exact same product in different packaging? How much do these choices really matter? As we've been spending time with the stories of our faith, we arrived this morning at the story of Joshua and the choice he puts before the people. And Joshua begins by doing exactly what we've been doing each week. He tells the story. He calls the people together and recounts the ways that God has been faithful, beginning with Abraham and running all the way through the people's present situation. God was with Abraham and Sarah, with Isaac, with Jacob and Esau, with Joseph. God called Moses and Aaron to set the people free, and God was with them when they confronted Pharaoh, when they found themselves stuck between the army and the sea, when they came to Sinai and received the law. And Joshua fills in a little bit of what we skip over as well. God was with the people when they lived in the wilderness, providing daily bread and fresh water and protection from enemies. God was with them when Balaam came to curse them. God was with them when they crossed over Jordan and made war on the people living in the land they believed God had promised to them. 
God was with them as cities fell and enemies fled. And now the people were living in towns they had not built, eating the fruit of crops they had not planted. And God was with them. Now Joshua says they have a choice to make. Revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It seems like a pretty straightforward choice, doesn't it? I mean, it really ought to be a no-brainer. I've just reminded you how powerful and gracious and wonderful the Lord is and how the Lord brought us victory over our enemies and their gods. So do you want to serve this big, strong, loving God? Or one of those other gods that can't do anything for you? And naturally, the people say, we too will serve the Lord. We've heard that before, haven't we? Just last week, we heard the story of Moses establishing the covenant between God and the people. And the people said, we're going to do everything that God tells us. And the words have barely left their lips before they get distracted by something else. And if we read on past Joshua's story, we get into the book of Judges. And we find that the whole book is one endless cycle. Times are good and the people do their own thing. The enemy is raised up and oppresses them. The people cry out to God. God raises up a judge who delivers them and makes the times good again. Rinse and repeat over and over and over. At the end of Judges, we are left with this ominous statement. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. So I wonder, beloved, do you see yourself in this story? Have you ever had to choose where your loyalties lie? Have you ever been the one to give an ultimatum where it seemed like it was an easy choice? The choice Joshua put to the people is the same one before you and me today. Choose this day whom you will serve. And as Bob Dylan said, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Now that's something Martin Luther understood as well. In his large catechism, he explored the question of what constitutes a God during his explanation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Luther writes, a God means that from which we are to expect all good, and to which we are to take refuge in all distress. So that to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe him from the whole heart. As I've often said, that the confidence and faith of the heart alone make both God and an idol. That now I say, upon which you set your heart and put your trust, is proper your God. So on the one hand, church, we have a paralyzing number of options to choose from. We can, and perhaps often we do, put our trust in money, power, popularity, sex, drugs, privilege, possessions, or other people. But then Jesus reminds us in the 12th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So at the end of the day, there's really only one choice, God or not God. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will the Lord be your God, or will you trust in something or someone else? Will you give your life to the cause of the kingdom, or will you spend your life building up kingdoms of your own? Will you follow Jesus' mission to bring good news and to be good news to the poor, the imprisoned, the sick, and the oppressed? Or will you go your own way? Will your words and actions serve life? Or will they be death-dealing? 
Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, I wonder, beloved, if maybe the way that Joshua frames this is a little misleading. Because the choice isn't a box we tick on the census or a roster we join with a local church. <laughs> the choice is not so simple as the old hymn makes it seem. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Nor is it something necessarily so grand and momentous as a public declaration of allegiance or a ritual like baptism or confirmation, though those are certainly important things that we do. No, folks, if Joshua's statement is misleading, it is because he makes it sound like it is just one choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. But we will also have to choose tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. Choose this day whom you will serve, but in truth, we may need to choose again this evening, or this afternoon, or on the drive home when someone cuts us off in traffic. If we truly make 35,000 choices a day, at least a few of those are going to have something to do with who we serve and how we serve them. Will I take a few minutes to pray and read my Bible? Or will I sleep a little later or watch another episode of that show? Will I take some extra time to show my partner or my children that I care for them? Or will I just assume they know how I feel because I'm too busy right now? Will I give my best effort at my job or will I just do what I have to to get through the day? Will I take care of my body with what I eat and drink and how I move? Or will I just take it for granted until there's an emergency? Will I examine how my choices impact the earth and all who live in it? Or will I treat the land, its resources, and its creatures as something disposable, something to which I am entitled? Will I look for the face of Christ and the people around me, even and especially the ones who challenge me? Or will I treat those around me with apathy and contempt? We have these choices every day, multiple times a day. And I will grant you that on an individual basis, none of these things seem like they are particularly life and death. You are probably not jeopardizing your health if you hit the drive through every once in a while or occasionally skip leg day. You are probably not jeopardizing your soul if you miss one day of reading your Bible. But, beloved, the choices we repeat become habits, and habits are hard to change. When you're in the habit of taking care of your body, you notice the days you take off. When you're in the habit of treating others with kindness, your conscience bothers you when you give offense. When you're in the habit of deepening your relationship with God, you want more opportunities to spend time in praise, in prayer, study, and service. On the other hand, when you're not in the habit of working out, that first day back at the gym might be enough to discourage you from coming back at all. When you're not in the habit of treating others kindly, you see no reason to go out of your way to help someone else if there's no benefit for you. When you're not in the habit of seeking God's heart, things like worship and prayer and Bible study can feel like an imposition the choices we repeat become habits. And if we are not in the habit of serving life, then by our action or our inaction, we are in the habit of dealing death. Choose this day whom you will serve. Dear church, it is a choice that is put to us many times a day. And the truth is, we will not always choose the banana. We won't always make the best choice, and there's grace for that. But the more we choose the things that God would choose, the more we seek to want the things that God wants, the more we are intentional and explicit 
about declaring in word and deed that we will serve the Lord, and the more it becomes a habit. Discipline is a habit. Discipleship is a habit. Serving life is a habit. And the more we cultivate it in our lives, the more we will flourish. The more our families, our friends, our neighbors will flourish. The more our communities, our country, the world will flourish. Our individual choices may not seem to have dire consequences, but beloved, our habits can change the world. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May that be our choice this day and every day. May we be intentional and explicit about choosing God. May we make serving life a habit that the world can see. And as you cultivate these habits, may you see yourself in God's story. May you share your story with the world. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able, beloved. Let us join our hearts and voices in our hymn of the day, O oh, Jesus, I have promised. <laughs> our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated. You may kneel or sit for prayers. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. For all your followers, that they might commit our lives to you, make us skilled in compassion and grace, and equip us to share the good news with all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For air and sky, clouds and sun, that they provide rain to parched lands and relief to flooded land, ground. Renew and restore our polluted atmosphere and empower us to be worthy stewards of creation. We pray for all who are recovering from natural disasters, especially those recovering from Hurricane Ian. Thank you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For all who aspire to positions of authority, that they desire wisdom, seek truth, rule with fairness, and have the courage to do what is right, eliminate oppression and injustice, and make us dedicated servants of justice and mercy. Hear us, O oh God. For all who are lonely, especially those who have newly arrived in an unfamiliar city or country, political prisoners without recourse to justice, hospital patients without visitors, and any who are ill or grief-stricken, especially all those whose names are on our prayer list and all those we name before you now, aloud and in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. For those who lead as council members in our congregation, Jerry, Jason, Monica, John, Brenda, Bill, Jim, Kristen, and Jean, bless them with discernment and passion as they seek to lead St. Martin's where you lead. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For those who have taught faith and now rest in your heavenly peace, that we remember and give thanks for those saints who shared the gospel through word and deed. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Beloved, let us share that peace with one another. Oh, I knew I had. 
Now, beloved, as we prepare to come to the table of grace, we invite those of you worshiping along at home to have bread and wine or crackers and juice with you so that you also may celebrate this feast of love with us. For those here in person, if you would prefer to have a prepackaged communion kit, we do have those available. Please ask our usher as you are invited forward to the table. All are welcome at this table. I invite you to rise as you are able. The Lord be with you. supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this for the remembrance of me gathered into one by the Holy Spirit we pray as Jesus taught our Father hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. The kingdom, power, and glory are yours, now and forever. Beloved, no matter who you are, what you've done, or what has been done to you, this table is set for you. All are welcome at the Lord's table. Come. For all is now ready.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace unto life everlasting. Amen. 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 Beloved, I invite you to rise as you're able for the benediction. God who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Amen. Let us join our hearts and voices in our sending song, Give Me Jesus. <laughs>
Go in peace, beloved, with Christ beside you. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.